Going into 2021, it looked like the Giants had, for the most part, solved their issues in the outfield. This was kind of a recurring theme under the last few years of the old front office. The Giants were getting no production out of their outfielders. But uh, with the breakout performance of Mike Yastrzemski in 2020, with Alex Dickerson and Darren Ruff and Austin Slater kind of arriving on the scene and performing well, it seemed that the Giants were well on their way to solving their outfield issues. But in 2021, whether it was Dickerson or Yastrzemski or Slater, guys kind of fell back down to earth a little bit in the outfield. And so what are the projections for 2022? Where are some areas of need for the Giants going into next year? And who are some players that could help the Giants going into next year in the outfield? So we'll talk about all of that next on today's Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants baseball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on this show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available on all platforms now, including YouTube as well. And coming up on today's show, I want to look at the outfield. Like I said, yesterday we talked about the starting pitching projections. We looked at catcher, first base, second base, and shortstop. So today I want to do outfield, also get to third base, and possibly relief pitching as well if we have time. But I mentioned the outfield first, so let's jump in there. It is an interesting kind of story uh, with the outfield being such an issue under the old regime, enter Farhan Zaidi, and he seemed to solve a lot of those issues in the first couple of years, but then certain guys have fallen back down to earth a little bit. And for example, Alex Dickerson looked like a part of the solution in left, and then he just had a miserable 2021 and was designated for assignment recently. But in left field, looking at the projection here by Steamer, and these projections can be found on fan graphs. Uh, in left field, Steamer is projecting Lamont Wade Jr. to be the primary uh, player at the position, which I think is accurate at this moment in time. And they've got him basically platooning with Darren Ruff and Austin Slater. And I think that that is correct. And so, you know, one player in Dickerson fell off in 2021, and another player in Wade Jr., broke out for the Giants. So Wade Jr. in 2021, man, he hit 18 home runs in just 381 plate appearances. The big question when he came here in a trade that was kind of a minor move for Sean Anderson early in the 2021 calendar year, the big question was, is he ever going to hit for power? And it seemed that he had good on-base fundamental kind of skills, but More than anything, he hit for power, and I I would say that you could use a little more on base, and I mean, the power was better than the on base skills, so that's kind of amazing, and he hit 253 with a 326 on base, 482 slugging, about 17% above average by weighted runs created plus. However, the projection for 2022 has him coming back down a little bit and having a 320 weighted on base average versus the 343 weighted on base average he had in 2021. And so this is just an example of a projection system being a little bit slow to believe a breakout performance. And so, yes, obviously there's some chance that he falls back down to earth a little bit, but also there's some chance that Wade Jr. has just gotten better and broken out. And so this is one where I'm kind of on the fence. It could go either way. 
he is out of options. And so very good chance he's just part of the team moving forward. There's a lot of club control, so he can be retained by the Giants for many years here, but they can't send him down. So he has to be on the roster. Otherwise, they would have to you know, trade him or DFA or something, which obviously I w- they wouldn't DFA him at this point, but a trade... I'm not saying that's likely, but I'm just saying that's the only alternative. They can't send him to the minor leagues. So anyway, it's a modest projection for Wade Jr. And then the platoon partners, Ruff and Slater, modest projections as well, kind of not believing the breakout performances, although it is getting better on Darren Ruff, projecting a 335 weighted on base average, which is significantly better than average, but also significantly worse than what he's done the last couple of years when he's had roughly a 380 on base average, excuse me, weighted on base average uh, the last couple years each and combined. So I would take the over on Darren Ruff personally, and I don't know exactly what to expect from Austin Slater, but against lefties, he continued to be quite productive. But the fact is, all these players combined uh, are projected at just 1.7 fan graphs wins above replacement which has them 19th out of 30 teams in terms of the projection. So that's not great. Um, I would take the over on that. I think Wade Jr. and Ruffin Slater, Wade Jr. being the left-handed side of the platoon, Ruffin Slater being the right-handed side, I think that's a pretty solid uh, group there to platoon. We all saw the upside and potential of a Wade Jr. and of a Ruff, and so, and Slater too. I know he had a a worse year in 2021 than kind of the awesome performance we saw in the short season. But I just think it is a solid group. But as we'll see, like, I think you could get away with this at one position. If your other two outfield spots are really strong, you can just kind of bank on getting that overperformance versus the projection. But when we see this at each and every position, that to me is what spells, I don't want to say trouble at this stage, given that the offseason is far from over. But it does say to me that they're going to need to make an upgrade or multiple upgrades in the outfield. So coming up next, we'll shift over to center and right. And as I said, we'll eventually get to third base, which is also uh, potentially an area of some weakness. And we'll get to relief pitching as well if time permits. Bet Online has you covered all season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football season continues the march to the playoffs. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all of the sports action this season. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code LOCKED ON to receive your bonus. From basketball, football, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. Does this sound familiar? You've got one device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows, you're watching sports highlights on your phone, and you've got your neighbor's best friends log in for the good stuff. I want to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment you love without the hassle and a great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream, and it brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before, so you can watch your favorite sports movies and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part, there's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with DirecTV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. All right, here we go. We're going to keep this thing going. Look at center and right. As we have seen, left field, I think, is solid, and I would bet on them overall beating the projection there if it's Wade Jr. and Ruff and Slater. But there's uncertainty and with uncertainty comes risk and I think you can tolerate it at one position as I said but if you have uncertainty all across the board then you've got potentially a problem too much risk. Uh, Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. 
We're free and available on all platforms. So sliding over to center field, this is probably the position in the outfield at least where the Giants are least settled. I have to scroll and scroll and scroll to find them in this ranking. Steamer is projecting the Giants to be 24th out of 30 teams in the outfield with the primary plate appearance recipient being Steven Duggar. And I think it is worth mentioning right now that Steven Duggar is another guy who is out of minor league options. And so, you know, having him on the team is something they're, they'll either be forced to do or they'll have to make a move. They cannot send him to the minor leagues anymore without his consent. And Steven Duggar had, like so many Giants, a breakout type performance in 2021. But the issue was there were still quite a bit of red flags in the offensive profile. I think there's no doubt he's a very good base runner. He's a very good defensive center fielder. The question has always been, is he going to be able to hit? And this was the first year in which he hit with any kind of authority. And it was a good offensive year for Steven Duggar. He had a 257 average, 330 on base percentage, 437 slugging, just a solid line, weighted runs created plus of 107, meaning uh, all-encompassing number here, about 7% better than league average. However, strikeout rate was 29.6%. That's high. Batting average on balls in play, 355. So when you need a 355 batting average on balls in play just to be close to league average offensively, to me, that spells trouble. And that's baked into the projection here that has Steven Duggar uh, coming in about 15% below league average offensively. Part of that is just not believing 2021 exclusively, but also looking at 2020, 2019, and 2018. And it doesn't understand that, you know, maybe the hitting coaches changed him. It was clear that there was something different about Steven Duggar and that it wasn't just a fluky, you know, a lot of times we look at average on balls in play and just say he was lucky, but it was clear from watching him that there was a difference in the way he was approaching his at-bats and he was much better at uh, laying off pitches out of his wheelhouse, basically, and he tightened up uh, some of the holes that he had in his swing. And so I believe in Steven Duggar to an extent, and if he can hit at all, he's a valuable player because of the plus defense in center and the plus uh, speed and base running. And the fact that he's out of minor league options may force them to have him on the roster and to continue to give him opportunities. However, the rest of the guys projected to play some center here for the Giants in 2021, uh, Mike Yastrzemski, I think that's fair. He has played center every year that he's been here. Sometimes he's not a primary center fielder, but he plays the position sometimes. Elliot Ramos getting some plate appearances. Austin Slater, I think this is a, a little bit less than he'll end up getting. He does play there quite a bit. Uh, Lamont Wade Jr., some plate appearances there, and Mauricio Dubon. But overall, just 1.8 uh, Fangraphs wins above replacement at the position, position projected, and that's 24th. And so, again, uncertainty and risk, we're looking at it with left field and center field now. And so that's just kind of the state of it. And so let's move on to right field and see if things get any better for the Giants. And they should but still, I think kind of like left field, they're still in a position where it's maybe not quite enough. And so in right field, the primary recipient of plate appearances here figures to be Mike Yastrzemski. And the projection for Yastrzemski is for him to be closer to league average than the breakout MVP type performer we saw in 2020 in the short season. I think we've all had enough time to see that the 2020 season maybe gave us some performances that we read into a little bit too much, not just Giants fans, but in the industry. We were talking about the, the fact that we had like Cy Youngs and MVPs is kind of crazy given that it was only a 60 game season. And in hindsight, I think it's really easy to see that. However, I mean, what Yastrzemski did 
it was he had a monster season. Just the performance was great. And this year, he definitely took a step backwards. He only hit 224 with a 311 on base and 457 slugging. It was basically a struggle for most of the year for Yastrzemski, but he still managed to put up 2.2 Fangraphs wins above replacement because he's a good base runner and he's a good defender in right field. And even with all his struggles, he still managed to be uh, slightly above average offensively with a 106 weighted runs created plus. And how he does it is with plus power. He's had an isolated power north of 233 each of the last three seasons, his only three seasons in the league. So in his major league career now, he's played in 300 games, has over 1,000 plate appearances, and has hit 255 with a 336 on base and 500 slugging. That's about 20% above average offense. So he's been a good player, but the projection has him kind of continuing to settle in at closer to league average offensively with a 105 weighted runs created plus. And so when you combine that with some right field play by Lamont Wade Jr., again, remember the projection is kind of uh, mediocre for Wade Jr. and Slater, same thing. Uh, that, that has the Giants overall coming in 17th out of 30 teams. And so they're uh, below league average, below the median at each of these pos positions in terms of the projection. And that's when I start to think they need to make an upgrade somewhere. And I think that's kind of obvious. We've been talking about it all season long, how kind of a right-handed position player who can play pretty much every day at one of these positions would be a good fit for the San Francisco Giants. So coming up next, we'll look at some of the possible solutions here for the Giants going into next season. With so much uncertainty, I think it is clear that a move may need to be made. And then we'll also try to take a look at a third base, if time permits, uh, relief pitching, if time permits. All right, here we go. We're going to talk about the possible solutions for the Giants in the outfield. I don't think it necessarily has to be a right-handed hitter, but Farhan Zaidi has basically said that they are... They, he said that a right-handed hitter who has good at-bat quality and power uh, kind of fits our team. And the question was about Seiya Suzuki, who's been posted from Japan and... I've gotten a lot of questions about his 30-day posting window with the lockout, right? So what's happening with that? So what's happening with that is that the lockout has frozen or paused the 30-day window. So he was posted for about a week, and so that's on, on hold. So as soon as there's a resolution and a new CBA is agreed to, then that window will unpause. And so, yeah, he's just kind of in limbo with the rest of us for now. But Seiya Suzuki does make sense. I mean, if you look at the production he was able to do or put up in uh, Japan, he was a monster with plate discipline and power as a right fielder. And so I think that, you know, a right fielder makes a lot of sense for the Giants because I personally don't just want to hand Steven Duggar the job, I think, as a backup, he makes more sense as somebody who can come in as a defensive replacement, as a pinch runner, and also get opportunities throughout the year as kind of your fourth or fifth outfielder because he can't be optioned. I just I think that you want to carry him on your team unless someone is giving you good value in a trade. So that's I but I don't necessarily see him as the starter. Although he could be. He's so good defensively and as a base runner that, like I said, if he just hits at all, he could definitely start there. But if you get like a right fielder, then you could put Mike Yastrzemski in center field where I think he's capable. And you could platoon him with, say, Austin Slater in center. And then in left, you could have Lamont Wade Jr. and Darren Ruff. So that's still a little bit too, more uncertainty than I would want. But if you had just a stud right fielder, it would make things 
easier to stomach. But I don't know. I mean, Seiya Suzuki represents some risk as well because he's never played in the major leagues. But Nick Castellanos is out there. I don't think he can play right field at Oracle Park. He's notoriously known as not a very good defender at all. And right field at Oracle Park is challenging. So he would undoubtedly have to play left if he's playing in the field at all. Uh, a DH probably coming to the National League under the new CBA. But I don't think they want just like a primary DH. I think it'll be a position they rotate guys through, ideally. So say you've got Nick Castellanos in left. You can platoon uh, Mike Yastrzemski and... Austin Slater in center and then in rough. What in right? What are you going to do? Platoon Wade Jr. and Ruff. I don't know that I want Darren Ruff playing right field at Oracle Park. So it's hard for me to see the fit necessarily if we're talking about a, a left fielder and not a right fielder. And I don't necessarily see any primary kind of center fielders on the market. There was Starling Marte, but he signed with the New York Mets. So if you had a center fielder, you could do your uh, Yastrzemski and Slater platoon in right and Wade Jr. and Ruff in left, but that is no longer a possibility. There's also Chris Bryant, who remains a free agent, and he can play left, he can play center, and he can, of course, play third base as well. He can play some right, but he did not play it well at Oracle Park. So I think there continues to be a fit with Bryant. And also, you know, Tommy Pham is a guy who stands out to me as a possible fit. And it would be a lot cheaper. Not that I'm just like rooting for uh, cheaper contracts, but I like him as a buy low candidate. And also Michael Conforto, kind of a, a dark horse fit for the San Francisco Giants. I like a lot about Michael Conforto. The one thing is he's a left-handed hitter, not a right-handed hitter. So we shall see what they do. It could be a trade too. I mean, that's the other thing is we all talk about who's in the free agent class. Well, there's also trade possibilities as well. And so those are, I don't, they're not infinite, but there's a ton of trade possibilities and it would take all off season long to explore each and every one. So it's just something to look out for as well whenever the offseason resumes. There's also Trevor Story as a possible outfield candidate. I'm intrigued by that. A guy who can really truly move around potentially. He is a very good runner. And so I think teams, some teams view him as a possible candidate in the outfield. And I am intrigued by that because he's got some thunder in the bat. And I would be intrigued by Trevor Story joining the San Francisco Giants. So those are just some names to throw out there in terms of what's left on the free agent market. Uh, let's talk about third base really quickly because I've been meaning to get to that. So in terms of the steamer projection, where do the Giants rank at third base? Again, I have to scroll and scroll. They come in at number 20, of course, out of 30 teams with Evan Longoria projected to be roughly league average offensively. He, like so many Giants, had a good 2021 season, but he did kind of fade down the stretch for the second consecutive year. And for the fourth straight year, every year he's been with the Giants, he has not managed to eclipse even league average offensively against right-handed pitching. So I have long viewed him as a platoon candidate, but he has long not been platooned. There was a little bit of it at the beginning of the year with La Stella playing some third base against right-handed pitching, but La Stella got hurt and then Longoria uh, was having a lot of success. And then when La Stella came back, Longoria came back and, and just kind of was playing every day. Now, of course, Longoria being a very good, the by far the best defensive third baseman they have, their other options are just borderline unplayable, if not just flat out unplayable defensively at third base with Wilmer Flores, Donovan Solano, who's now a free agent, and La Stella, uh, all of whom just bad defensive third baseman from what we saw. So that has made Longoria just a more attractive everyday option at third base. But you're just not getting any offensive production uh, against right-handed pitching. He was a monster, Longoria was, against lefties. 
he's pretty much been a monster against lefties every year he's been with the Giants. So to me, if you could find a way to get him a platoon partner at third base, the team would be better off for it. But they have just seemed uh, resistant to do that. And Longoria is entering finally the last year of his deal with the Giants. There is a club option for 2023. And it's actually kind of an interesting call because it is a $13 million club option, but it has a $5 million buyout. So that effectively makes it an $8 million decision that the Giants have to make. And so that's kind of reasonable, $8 million for one year. But if I had to guess right now, that's probably not going to be picked up. But if he can, if he has another season and fully healthy, uh, a season like he had this year, but more playing time, he definitely could be retained given that it's only $8 million. So anyway, it's not a great ranking there, number 20. So the outfield and third base are areas where the Giants need to consider making an upgrade to their offense. They've lost Buster Posey. We talked about how they rank dead last at the catcher position in terms of these projections. Of course, prospects are not necessarily rated highly by a projection system. So that's why that's happening with Joey Bart. But as we saw in 2020, there is downside for that kind of poor performance. We saw that in 2020 from Bart. So yeah, they have some areas they need to improve. Like I said, they lost Posey. They've lost Bryant to free agency. He is still available. But a lot of uh, time left in the offseason, but work to do for the Giants. So anyway, at some point later, we'll talk about the bullpen, which is actually in pretty good shape, in my opinion. And later on in the week, we'll continue to provide daily coverage. We'll have a mailbag coming up at some point. So hit that subscribe bit button and come back every single day for Locked on Giants. Uh, once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. You can follow me on Twitter at Ben Kaspik. K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out so much. So thank you in advance and thank you to everyone who's done so already. I can't wait to be with you again tomorrow. Thank you so much for listening. You are now Locked on Giants.